Lonnie sat in the corner of the restaurant and waited for the waitress to bring out his breakfast. Across from him sat an 87-year-old half-blind man who even at that age stood six feet seven inches tall. The old man's hair was gray and thin and cut short. He wore a long sleeve collared shirt and brown pants that were held up by a black leather belt that had a buckle that read slim. A collapsible white cane lay on the floor next to him. I ain't completely blind, he told Lonnie. I can see rays of light and shadows. I can read signs once in a while, but it wears me out. That's why I couldn't see the sugar. It's right there, but not to me. How long your eyes been bad? asked Lonnie. I gave my driver's license up when I was 72, almost 15 years ago. That's got to be rough, huh? Slim nodded slowly. Losing your driver's license is the hard realization that you're only one step from a coffin. Lonnie leaned back in his chair and took a drink of coffee, and the waitress set down their plates. I hate asking this, but I guess I can't help it. You ever play basketball? The old man again nodded. I was 6'11 at my tallest. I played for NAU, the university in Flagstaff. I wasn't much of a player. I was just taller than everyone else. Then the Second World War started and I joined the Navy. But with my height, I couldn't be on the ship. So they stationed me at a naval yard in Philadelphia. I was electrician's apprentice and then the war kept going and going and I was certified an electrician. So you never had to go overseas? No. What'd you do after that? When the war ended, I went back to NAU. My mother had always wanted me to graduate from college, so I went back to get a degree. And then, well, the last year I was there, the last year I, I met a woman, the assistant coach of the women's basketball team. She was older than me, 35 or so. I was maybe 23. She said she was 6'1", but she was at least 6'3", a real tall brick of a woman. Together you should have seen us. People would stop and stare at us. But I guess how could you not stare? And she, well, she was the first woman I ever met who gave me the time of day. Slim stopped and felt around for his fork and ate a bite of huevos rancheros. What happened to her? Lonnie asked. I married her, Slim said and let off a broken laugh and set down his fork. For me, I never once imagined having a woman. I mean, before her, I'd never even been on a date. I was a virgin. So I was more than surprised when she was interested in me. I'd heard she'd been married a couple times. And I also heard that she'd been hospitalized after the last divorce for trying to do herself in. But I'd never been with a woman, so my head was pretty far in the clouds. And I didn't listen to anyone's advice or, or see any of the warnings. I was just so relieved that anyone would want me, that a woman would want me. And I guess for a while she did. But I don't know. The night we got engaged, she began calling us the Colossal Corcorans because my last name is Corcoran. She was like that, both funny and mean at the same time. I didn't understand that side of her when we first met. I was just so happy to think I was going to have a wife that I didn't think about, about who she really was. She kept these moods, you know. Moods where she would talk about herself in the third person. Her name was Jamie. She'd say things like, I'm Jamie the giant with the big fat feet. I'm as ugly as a bug with black eyes and broken teeth. A waitress then came and filled both her coffees. And when she left, Lonnie said, she was a basketball coach. Slim nodded. A pretty good one. At least for a while she was. 
When we were in Arizona, I liked the way she coached. In front of the athletes, she was serious, but, but kind. And especially to the tall ones or the ones who weren't pretty. Those girls seemed to really like her. Sometimes a person picks on the people that remind them of themselves, but not Jamie. She took care of the straggly girls, the awkward ones. I guess I liked her most because of that. But, but then she got an offer to be the head coach of the women's team up at the University of Montana in Missoula. It was a real step up. So in a rush, we got married at the courthouse in Flagstaff and drove up to Montana in a maroon Ford Deluxe. I had to have the car specially altered so the seat would go back far enough that I could fit in. But that's the way it was. I had to have my clothes handmade, my shoes were a size 16, and I'd get those handmade. Even my sleeping bag was handmade. Slim made another mouthful and felt around for his coffee cup and took a sip. Well, we got to Montana, and of course we stuck out like sore thumbs. And right away she hated the winners. They were worse than Flagstaff. More snow, longer stretches of cold. But what I think she hated most was that her team was no good. She didn't have much to work with. There just weren't a lot of good players coming out of Montana at the time. But me? I liked it there. I've always liked the woods, and I liked the town and the people. I didn't mind the winters. And after six months or so, I got on with the university in the maintenance department. And after that, our life just sort of went along like normal people's do. A couple years passed. But, well, she began to struggle with her job and with the fact that we couldn't have children, that she couldn't get pregnant. It seemed like a dark cloud just kind of stopped over our house and stayed. Then a girl from Butte came to the school. She was about the best player my wife had ever seen at that level. The problem was, around the same time, my wife turned 40, and 40 can be a hard year for a woman who wants kids. A milestone year to some women. And I guess it was to my wife. And then this girl from Butte shows up. A great athlete and headstrong and smart. She was 5'8", pretty, blonde, and of course popular with everyone. And she was so fast it was, it was unreal. And she could really shoot. She was a good kid. But my wife? Well, my wife started picking on the girl. Picking on her so hard that she finally benched her. Benched the kid for nothing. No real reason at all. And then a strange thing happened. The team protested. The girls mutinied. They all mutinied, every single one of them. And that says something especially back then. Kids just didn't do that sort of thing. Of course, the news got around the university, and my wife was horrified. She couldn't sleep, couldn't eat. She worried that everyone was turning against her, worried that she was going to be fired. So she let the girl play again. But not even a week after that, during a practice, my wife hit the girl hit her in the face with a closed fist. The assistant coach, a math professor, saw it. And when he went to confront my wife, he could tell she'd been drinking. I didn't even know she drank. I don't know how I didn't know, but I didn't. Well, as you can imagine, it was a scandal. Everyone found out, and she was fired. The problem was we still live there. Two giants in a freezing fishbowl for everyone to gawk at, she'd say. She was so embarrassed she wouldn't leave the house. She wouldn't even go to the store. We didn't know what to do because by then, I was the head of the maintenance department for the whole university. I was making good money. So we moved 30 miles away to a town called Alberton. We rented a house and 
I commuted. But there was nothing for her to do out there. Nothing. And well, she didn't get better. She'd always worked, but now she was washed out as a teacher and washed out as a coach. There weren't a lot of jobs in that area for women, and she wasn't the kind to be a waitress or work in a shop. A whole year passed and she didn't leave the house. A whole year. She didn't even go into the backyard or get the mail. It was like she put herself in a sort of prison. And then a strange thing happened. She was 41 and got pregnant. And my God, just like that, some of the life came back to her. She began walking to the store. She put flowers on the table. She cooked dinner. Her belly got bigger and she got better. She didn't even mind going to Missoula to the doctor for checkups. She was just happy, I guess. And then, well, around the six months she miscarried and it was, it was awful after that. She quit getting out of bed. Quit being a person much at all. And she began taking it out on me. Began saying that the way I ate, the sound of it, was like an ice pick in her ear. That the way I breathed and my sleep made her want to stick her hand through a glass window. That the way I shaved, the way I took a shower, the way I sighed when we watched TV. All those things, she said, drove her to want to kill herself. I decided we'd wait out the winter and then get out of there. I began applying to universities in California and Arizona, hoping to get on with a maintenance crew. And for a while, uh, for a while I tried. When each payday came, I'd bring her home a gift, a box of candy, a new nightgown, a novel, a record. And then one time I bought her a finch. She'd always wanted a bird, but I was against it. There's something about a bird in a cage that's always been hard for me to take. I told her, how about a cat or a dog? A bird can live wherever it wants and travel wherever it needs. A bird can winter in Mexico or South America, and it can fly above all the ugliness of the world. Why well, put something like that in a cage? But my wife, she loved birds, especially finches. She had one as a kid, and she was the kind of person who always said things were better in her past. Her home was better, her family, and her finch, Jim. And then I walked past this pet store one day, and in the window, I saw they had finches for sale. So I bought her one and a cage and food and all that, and brought it home. And for a while, she loved that bird. Strange as it might sound, it stabilized our life a bit. She didn't all of a sudden want to go to a restaurant or to the grocery store, but she began taking baths again, long baths where she would set little Joe on the toilet and talk to him from the tub. And then I remember, well, on Friday night she made a batch of spaghetti and we were drinking off a gallon jug of red wine. There was a blizzard starting outside, but we had a good wood stove and I'd just gone shopping so we had a lot of food and I had two days off. We were okay. Everything seemed all right. It wasn't that we were exactly happy right then. It was just Friday night and she wasn't mad or sad. She was just a woman having a glass of wine, listening to the radio and making dinner. Then we sat down to eat and, well, all of a sudden she picked up her plate and slammed it down. She slammed it down so hard it broke in half. The way you eat disgusts me, she screamed. 
The way you chew makes me want to throw up. And then it just started, her throwing a sort of fit. Well, the finch began to panic. It flew around in its cage, chirping and crying and being worried. And then finally I got upset. I threw a water glass against a cave and I told her I was tired of it. Tired of the way she brooded. Tired of the way she blamed me for the miscarriage. Blamed me for her getting fired. Blame me for things I couldn't control, for things I didn't even understand or know about. She got so upset after that, her whole body just shook, and her face got this crazed look to it. In her nightgown and socks, she grabbed little Joe in his cage and walked outside into the snowstorm. The whole time he's panicking and crying and flapping about. The snow was coming down hard and it was windy and she just opened up the bottom of the cage and the finch and the tin tray fell to the snow. Little Joe was just able to fly off and he vanished into the darkness. Well, Jesus, I put on my coat and boots as fast as I could and grabbed a flashlight. I looked and looked and looked for the bird. I was so worried I could hardly breathe. A little bird lost in a snowstorm. A little bird lost in a Montana winter. But of course, I never saw him again. The next day we were snowed in. The power was out and she stayed in bed. She wouldn't eat, wouldn't talk. I slept on the living room floor in a sleeping bag. The day after that, the sun broke and they plowed the roads. The power and the phone went back up and I called a co-worker who lived in Missoula and he came out and got me. I left her for good that day. I took my clothes and a few things that were mine, but I gave her everything else. We had a savings account and I went to the bank and took my name off it. I signed the car over to her and moved into a motel that rented rooms by the month. For a while, she begged me to come back. Four or five times a day, she'd phone the university asking for me. But I knew she'd give up, and after a time, she did. She packed her things, closed the bank account, and left town. She really left? asked Lonnie. Yeah. Well, what happened to her? Slim felt around the table for his coffee, found it, and took a sip. She drove down to Lafayette, Louisiana, where her sister lived. She moved into an apartment above her sister's garage and got a job as a secretary for a trucking company. One of the mechanics there was a 55-year-old Polish man. From what I heard, he was barely five feet, three inches tall and weighed over 250 pounds. She married him and they had two kids within the first three years. She was in her mid-forties by then, pretty old for having kids. But she had them, and eventually she even coached high school basketball. That doesn't make sense, said Lonnie. What doesn't? Her having kids and pulling out of it like she did. It happens. Lonnie shook his head. But it doesn't make sense. Slim sighed and said, The only thing I've learned in life is that nothing's for sure and nothing makes sense. But I was happy for her. She was in a lot of pain, and I'm just glad her kids won't be as tall as they would have been if they were mine. I don't wish that on anybody. Lonnie pushed his plate toward the center of the table and set his elbows down. So what'd you do? After her, you mean? Yeah. Slim shrugged. Worked. I ran the maintenance department at the university for 41 years. I bought a one-bedroom house. After a while, after a while, I just learned to get hobbies. I never did get to go on another date, though. But I, uh, my garage had a shop, 
spent a lot of time on projects, and I camped, and I learned how to fish. I had friends. But you know, that first year I was alone, I used to hike around Alberton. I bought a pair of high-powered binoculars, and I'd look for little Joe. Every weekend I would. I just couldn't get him out of my mind. That little bird trying to fly in a blizzard so far from anything he'd ever known. You ever see him? I thought I did a couple times, but I knew I was probably just fooling myself. Maybe I needed to fool myself. But now, it's different. Now, even though I can hardly focus my eyes, I see him. Sometimes he just appears. Sometimes he'll just suddenly be there next to me, and he'll tell me he's okay. And he thanks me for looking for him. I'm not crazy, Lonnie. I'm not. But I swear, I see him. 